good they got a bathroom. Thank you. Hi, Diego. Hi, Mary. Hi, Becky. Glad you could join us here. We're here in downtown Oakland, a press conference, uh, talking about the sweeps that went on the other night um, when 22 people were arrested. I believe it was 22. Uh, that's why we're here. We're getting ready to start the press conference. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. <coughs> anyway, just hang on for a minute or two. We're getting ready to start. Glad you're watching. Most important event in the rights. The homeless housing is a human right. Um, if you'd like to share this, uh, could you stare, share the hashtag Stop the Sweeps um, and share it on your Facebook page? I very much appreciate that. Let other people know that we're organizing here in Oakland to stop all the uh, discrimination and stuff that goes down with homeless people. Uh, solidarity to you, Diego. I know San Diego is a really bad place, or not San Diego, but Sacramento. Uh, the police there are especially bad, so I can say. They go out of their way to hurt homeless people, basically, in Sacramento. And this is just, not just from news reports that I get this, I get this from eyewitness accounts, uh, people that actually were homeless there. So you got to watch your back in, San, in uh, Sacramento, that's for sure. There's Nita. She's one of the lead organizers, the woman in the left. I wish we had a little brighter circumstances. Looks like it's the evening. It's actually nine o'clock. Nine, you know, looks like it's nighttime. Anyway, this is a this little area to your left while we're waiting. There's like a little causeway there. That's where. I had uh, cops from Oakland PD fired a couple of tear gas canisters off at me during the uh, Occupy Oakland, and they were breaking that up. It was pretty nasty here. Oakland police are very much nasty. Yeah, Diego, stop the sweeps. So well organized. And some background documents on the Boise case, the recent report that just got turned into a violation. All right. Thank you, Nita. That was Anita. Due to the volume. Yes, that is it. Do you know how to go live from here? Create a post or Facebook Live. And you want to get very close up. You're not going to sit in here. You're going to be sitting up there because you're not going to hear us from there with that phone. Okay? So, you're going to be All right. Mm -hmm. All right. One PSA, which is speaking. Hi, y'all. I'm going to go live. Thank you, Becky Lee.
in a couple if you like and I don't think we're gonna need any special mic hookups um, were you able to hear the speakers uh, people that were watching side. There you go. And I think that's a really comfortable spot for me too. Right behind you. Thank you, Becky. Appreciate it. If you go out there and press the left, there's a good time. We should be getting started any minute now. Please be patient and stand by. Yeah, we're a little late getting started due to inclement weather. Please stand by.
Any minute now. Sorry, uh, the people, but they're not on demand protesters. Our Facebook Live might be on demand, but I can't demand that these guys get ready any faster. So please stand by. You know, these are activists that have spent several days in lockup at Santa Rita, which is not the greatest place in the world, trust me. Although I've never been locked up there. I've been locked up in a lot of places, but never, never Santa Rita. And I visited the the women's minimum security facility, uh, federal facility, and a friend of mine that was in jail there, or prison there. Hello, everyone. And now we're getting started. For folks in the media, we do have media press packets for you. Uh, please come check with Talia at the front door. And this is Nita. She had um, the press packets out of trust Thank you for coming on this very cold day. Um, we are very happy to be here and to be able to um, talk to the media, to the public, about our experiences, um, and also what, why we even, you know, did our action in the first place. So without further ado, I'm going to, you know, today we're going to hear from the arrestees, as well as um, Stephen DiCaprio from Michael Johnson Civil Liberties Institute. Um, the Michael Johnson Civil Liberties Institute recently just um, turned in a document to the United Nations Human Rights Council about the overall criminalization of homelessness um, here in the United States. And a lot of it was based uh, informed by the work that we're seeing happening here and the, the inhumanity we've seen happening here in the Bay Area. So without further ado, I will ask Rosa to come up. And your name is? Oh, my name is Unity. Okay. My name is Rosa, and I am a renter here in Oakland, and I work as a web developer. I was arrested for protesting to demand an immediate end to the Oakland city government's terror campaign against those in our community who have been forced out of their homes and onto the streets to make way for the wealthy. We demand an immediate end to the destruction of our unsheltered neighbor's property, an end to the demolition of self-built homes, and an end to the harassment criminalization, and incarceration of our communities. As we peacefully demonstrated at Oscar Grant Plaza, protesters, as well as bystanders, were arrested and jailed with the outrageous bail of $5,000 per person to discourage us from continuing. However, we will not be discouraged from continuing our struggle to demand housing and dignity for all. While the Oakland City government terrorizes our unsheltered neighbors, Developers and landlords profit from a housing market that pushes people onto the streets through high rents and private property rights backed by police terror. People, especially black people, are forced out of their homes to make way for those who can afford to pay more for housing. Homelessness is a symptom of an exploitative system that puts profits before people. The system that enshrines developers and landlords' right to profit in the first place off of a stolen indigenous land. Homelessness in Oakland has increased by 47% since 2017. While there are more empty residencies in Oakland than there are people without housing, and unprecedented millions have been spent to solve homelessness in Oakland, Mayor Libby Schaaf has claimed that the primary cause of homelessness in the city is a shortage of housing. In reality, Schaaf's job as mayor is not to house the unhoused, but to oil the machine that necessarily creates houselessness in the first place. The exploitative system that produces and distributes housing to further enrich the already rich instead of to fulfill human needs. Our city governments are instruments for the exploitation of the oppressed class, maximizing profits for landlords and developers at the expense of the rest of us. Because I see that our neighbors are terrorized for being homeless by the very forces that have taken their homes, I understand that the struggle of the housed and of the unhoused is the same struggle. Those of us paying rent we cannot really afford. Those of us a paycheck away from being unsheltered. And those of us who can no longer find a way to afford to pay rent clearly share the same struggle. We see that the housed and the unhoused have a common enemy. And those becoming richer while the rest of us become poorer. 
This is why we unite as people of many backgrounds to take a stand against the continued terror of unsheltered people by the Oakland city government. We will continue our struggle so that we begin, can begin to make possible a world where we are not criminalized for existing, where black and indigenous people may determine our own destiny, and where a home is guaranteed to every person. Thank you. curbside communities, demolitions of homes, towing of vehicles people live in or store belongings in, including the upcoming evictions this week on Tuesday on Kirkham between 16th and 17th, and on Wednesday on 84th and 85th um, between East 13th and East 14th. We demand an immediate end to the destruction of curbside residents' personal property and survival here. We demand the City Council direct the Mayor and her administration two years ago to identify and make available at least two parcels of public land in each district to be used for sanctuaries, villages, or other community-led emergency approaches to support and shelter curbside communities. This has never happened, and it must happen immediately. No more fundraising for or building any more tough sheds. These programs are a waste of money and they are not effective to meet the scale of, homeless, of the homeless state of emergency or the actual needs of curbside residents. We demand an end to market rate and above market rate development. The city must turn its attention to the neglected, deeply affordable housing development goals in the next year. We demand an immediate upgrade all, uh, to all curbside communities with adequate, adequate porta potties, trash services, clean drinking water, solar power, and improvements to self-built homes. Due to his anti-homeless tendencies, his abuse of power, his complete disregard of the humanity and rights of curbside residents, his mismanagement of billions of dollars to homeless, the solutions to homelessness, we call for an immediate dismissal of assistant to the administrator, Joe, Joe DeVries. Due to his deep anti-homeless biases and arbitrary decision-making that, impact, that impacts the lives and well-being of Oakland's unhoused, he cannot lead the approaches to solve this crisis. The immediate implement implementation of City Councilwoman Nikki Fortunato's best recommendations to align the city approaches to homelessness with a human rights lens. We demand the demilitarization of encampments and the immediate dissolution of the City of Oakland's encampment management team. Yeah. jurisdiction of the park and rights is a blatant attempt to silence us. 
We were there deliberately to protest the mayor and her encampment management team's inhumane treatment of Oakland's unhoused and to dispel the lies and misinformation they have been feeding the media and public. Clearly, they did not want the truth to be known. Furthermore, citing those of us who are housed is a violation of our Eighth Amendment protection as interpreted by the Ninth Appellate Court case, Martin v. Boise. The city staff never met with us despite their claims. And as the case in all other evictions, demolitions, closures, and tows, human service staff never came to do their paid job of providing support and housing navigation. The city's public statement also claims it follows their policy to bad and have our belongings. If this is true, this will be the first time in the past three years advocates have been tracking the Department of Public Works behavior during clean and clears, curbside evictions, curbside home demolitions, that they will have followed their policy. We have not been notified where our property is or how to retrieve our property. None of our property has been recovered and multiple unhoused arrestees are without phones, IDs, and wallets. Once the sun had set, the police, had op police officers told us that we could have a bed at St. Vincent de Paul for the night. This offer continued until 11.30 p.m. However, to get a bed at St. Vincent de Paul, you must arrive at their facility at 5 p.m. We wanted to know why and how this special treatment was possible. Also, the six hours they were offering us was not adequate for any of our needs and did not offer any kind of stability. A protest camp was much more stable at a night in St. Vincent. St. Vincent de Paul, after St. Vincent de Paul, we would be forced to leave at 7 a.m. and carry our gear around all day. And for many of us, the lack of cleanliness, the chance of having our gear stolen, and the rude staff is not an environment that was adequate for safety or stability. The shelter system is broken. The city knows this. The homeless service providers know this, and the unsheltered know this. Yet the mayor wants to use millions of dollars to build more homeless shelters without drastically fixing this broken system. Many of us have advocated, advocated and advised that if the city is set on shelter beds, then they should at least improve the existing system instead of wasting public funds in a system that recycles people in and out of the streets. And why should millions be spent on beds where those resources could actually be used to build permanent housing? The main push prior to the creation of the new homeless shelters was a tough shed scam. Tough sheds do not work. They do not improve the lives of the vast majority of people who are pushed through them. Much like the shelter system, a majority of people are recycled back onto the streets after spending six months to a year in the tough sheds. In addition, the mismanagement of the tough shed sites by nonprofits who are receiving half a million dollars to run them is unacceptable. The Village of Mapleton Civil Liberties Institute has documented dozens of testimonies of abuse, punishment, loss of personal property, dismal conditions, harm and violence from former residents of the tough sheds. The tough shed program is merely a cosmetic approach that gives the illusion that something is that something is happening, that something is being done, while making homeless residents, not the homeless crisis, disappear. The mayor and her encampment team, encampment management team, need to come clean. Approaching homelessness as a humanitarian crisis is not their priority. However, approaching homelessness as an eyesore to their profit-driven development plans is a priority. That's making a handful of people very rich. The money is not reaching the people that has been intended to help. <coughs> There are literally thousands of Oaklanders, mostly black, mostly born and raised in Oakland, living on the streets tonight. Meanwhile, for every one unhoused person, four residential units stay empty in Oakland. Meanwhile, 200 permanent housing units that have been approved to be built over the next five years for low-income housing will happen. Over that same time, 50,000 market rate and above market rates will be built. The city is lying. They have no intention to, survive, to solve the affordable housing crisis or the homeless state of emergency. They have every intention of building for the rich, white folks who don't live here yet, while they leave the town to literally freeze to death on the streets. And next we'll have Yana talking about um, a, a deeper talk about how the Oakland City of Oakland actually does treat its unhoused. Yeah, sorry about the sound, but I can't get any closer. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ayanna Johnson. I'm a single mother, an entrepreneur, a longtime taxpayer, and voter. And I was born and raised in Oakland. Um, I worked with and voted for Libby Shab. I survived the encampment management team's demolition to my emergency home while I was homeless. So Mayor Libby Shab has been lying to the public regarding city actions against unhoused Oakland citizens. She claims to have taken a compassionate and humane approach. Her current actions have been ineffective. 
Taxpayer and voter resources wasted on knocking down Oakland residents who need her help the most. Nibby Shaft has destroyed the youth of the community and the youth uh, community built for me at the Housing Dignity Village almost a year ago today. I'm seeing her organizing to provide the same fate to my community now. She has met unhoused residents, attempts to create stability during a crisis with aggressive tactics, which is why in addition to the housing justice village demands, I'm seeking at this time to call Libby Shaft from office. Libby has often left the media and the voters in the dark, especially when they violate unhoused citizens' fourth, eighth, and fourteenth amendment rights by illegally searching and seizing property, punishing and criminalizing unhoused residents for trying to survive while unhoused, and not giving unhoused residents the same rights and protections as housed residents. Libby and her encampment management team's actions have resulted in five separate ongoing civil rights lawsuits against the city of Oakland. Libby and her team's actions also earned the United Nations attention. Last year, the United Nations internationally recognized the city of Oakland as one of the top human rights violators and unhoused people in the world. What an embarrassing record of a woman. <laughs> Could it be why she does not inform the public or allow the media to display the current response tactic used against unhoused citizens? The demolition of miniature built housing and towing of unhoused vehicles and criminalizing her citizens, leaving them in total despair. These tactics trigger emotional, mental, and physical setbacks. Responses such as depression, PTSD, anxiety, and panic attacks are quite common. Imagine losing something you know as your residence. Now, imagine how disruptive it is to, to your equilibrium when someone disposes your personal belongings. It also increases chances of losing employment or employment opportunities as well. The city is using resources that are not effective. We don't see our tax dollars hard at work for the citizens of Oakland who actually need it the most. In fact, she approved our tax dollars, $700,000 annual income, without proper protocol to a day in silver. A man directing her favorite nonprofit, Oakland Property. He is not an Oakland voter nor a resident. While all while we see all our local people dying without housing in the street, all the Libby Shaft solutions to the homeless crisis are temporary and don't match the size or need of this crisis. The main approach she has been pushing as a success after her tough shed. Not only does the manufacturer of tough sheds report that inhuman inhabitation of their product will cause respiratory disease and cancer, but their mismanagement by nonprofits receiving a half a million to staff them has resulted in dozens of testimonies of abuse, mistreatment, suffering, and harm. Why is, two, why is the two years that Libby and the encampment management team had to access the unprecedented millions, there are no resolutions for permanent housing for open unhoused demographics? Why over the next five years are only 200 units for low-income residents and over 50,000 unit housing units for the market rate and above? Libby's goal is to drive the long-time citizens of Oakland to relocate to alternative cities, while many while the city attempts to bring a new market to Oakland and still driving out national sports teams as well. City council recommendations have been ignored, especially for public land, sanctuary, village land, and immediate alternative to tra traditional permanent housing. We are tired of lack of assistance from unhousing racial disparity felt throughout the Oakland community, while OPD makes a whopping $30 million in overtime pay annually in the last three years. This can no longer be ignored. We don't want any more of Libby's Oakland or her promises. Please help me recall Libby Schaff as mayor and it will open doors to new prosperity and hopefully get us a professional sporting team back into rotation. <laughs> this Tuesday and Wednesday, Libby Schaff plans to use more of our tax dollars to destroy curbside communities in Kirkham. That's between 16th and 18th in West Oakland, Joaquin Miller Park, and in East Oakland on 83rd and 84th on East 14th, in the ring. The city plans on taking their homes with no permanent, permanent alternative, destroy a tight-knit community that lean on each other to survive and erase any stability they created for themselves. Their idea of housing is in an overnight shelter that city reps would die before bringing themselves or their children or families to be placed. I personally challenge the city to stay overnight at any of these facilities they attempt to place the unhoused. 
The Housing Dignity Village provided a safe shelter space for myself and other single mothers of Oakland and our families. Her greed took that away. We demand the city of Oakland turn our demands into policies that are implemented and enforced. And I'll call upon our community to join a recall effort. Thank you. 
City of Southwood until recently I was a nonprofit event organizer. Currently, I'm unemployed on disability insurance and housing insecure, sleeping on a friend's couch in West Oakland. My presence at Oscar Grant Plaza last Sunday was in solidarity with all unsheltered folks everywhere, as well as for all of us that are one missed check or emergency away from joining you. <coughs> Our traumatic arrests should be seen as a direct indictment of the state, the city of Oakland, the Alameda Sh County Sheriff's Department, and the Oakland Police Department's abuse of power and the law. In violation of our constitutional rights, 22 of us, 10 of us who were unhoused, were arrested for exercising our First Amendment rights by the Oakland PD on the morning of Monday, November 25th. 60 Oakland police officers, an excessive number, waited for media agencies to leave Oscar Grant Plaza that evening, then they illegally entered tents locked from the inside without a warrant, dragging us from them, inflicting trauma to all and injury to some, including one needing permanent shoulder damage to one of our organizers. When our sister demanded that her pat-down not be conducted by a male officer, the responding female officer crossed the line in her search to the point of molestation. From inside my tent on the plaza that night, I heard my neighbor screaming in pain as she was physically removed from her tent, while other voices yelled for the cops to stop hurting her and let her go. Eventually, I heard a voice identifying themselves as open police directly outside my tent, and I was requested to step out. I asked if they had adequate housing available, and they offered me a bed at St. Vincent de Paul for less than six hours, with no assistance beyond that. Not only is this not adequate, nor housing, but by any means, but what from I heard from the experiences of other binary, non-binary folks, that it is not safe or welcoming space for gender non-conforming humans. After being searched and cuffed, we spent some time on the plaza steps awaiting transport to Santa Rita. While we waited, we watched DPW throw our tents and everything in them into dump trucks and drive off. Laptops, backpacks, last mile transportation, prescription meds, cell phones, cash, bank cards, and wallets. Easily several thousand dollars worth of our lives and livelihoods, and all of it is still missing. None of us were given claim receipts or information on how to retrieve our property. Even one of our housed allies is still having difficulty locating it for us. Our trans sisters were misgendered, separated, and subjected to cruel and unusual treatment, to the point of one of them being dressed out in reds, meaning they were deemed high risk, simply because their pronouns didn't match their outward appearance. This high risk designation also placed them in solitary confinement for the majority of their stay, which can be extremely traumatic. Our only black brother arrested Ayat was dressed out in yellow and put in medium security, which insinuates to other incarcerated folks and jail staff that he wouldn't back down from a fight. The rest of us were processed through without too much hassle, other than the expected psychological abuse. We were given meals that barely passed as food. The sheriffs did their jobs and told us to shut up, a lot. They seemed 50% professional, about 50% condescendingly snarky. Processing us through Santa Rita taught us a lot including that by arresting 22 protesters without real cause, the jail's processing system was so backed up, weekenders and others being processed out were hung up for hours in the backlog, violating their due process rights as well. Criminalizing the unhoused is illegal, immoral, and just and inhumane. The City of Oakland and Mayor Schaaf's office, as well as the OPD, should be held accountable for the violation of our rights and the rights of all unhoused Oakland residents. Thank you. Our original vision was and our original demands, but to also raise up the experience of those who are unhoused. There's there's a pipeline that goes from homelessness to the prisons back to homelessness, and we wanted to raise that that reality up. Um, and also, um, the fact that so many women that at least you know in the women's uh, part of, of Santa Rita that we met were homeless, and that everyone there totally got what we were doing and they supported what we were doing. And we want to thank Libby for actually putting us in jail because it gave us an opportunity to do political education trainings in jail. Um, the two um, adverse possession trainings talked about human rights, um, informed the women that there was a strike happening next door in the men's prison. They didn't even know that um, that was happening. So I want to introduce Jasmine again, and she's going to talk more about the conditions that we witnessed the, uh, the folks in prison um, enduring. When I was in Santa Rita, I met several women who had been arrested for warrants they didn't even know about. 
even after following up with the police, in some cases more than once. One, one woman who was booked around the same time we were had just gotten home from work, only to find that the police had beaten her to her own house and arrested her on the spot for a warrant she didn't know about. Her boyfriend immediately posted her bail and waited outside from 4 a.m. past 11 a.m. while she sat in the hole in the While in the transfer room, I met a woman who was a weekender, which meant she had a prearranged release time every Sunday with the court so that she could get to work. Jail guards kept ignoring her and kept her there for hours and, uh, after her scheduled release time. Another woman had been sitting in the transfer room for seven hours before I got there and was also supposed to be released. I kept getting responses such as, we need to find your paperwork first, even though she had it in her hands. While I was in my pod, I learned my soulmates had not been between 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. and hadn't been outside in multiple days. My cellmates described the emotional abuse they received and even pointed out which guards smuggled in different drugs. When we did eat, it was bologna and nearly stale bread, maybe a tangerine and powdered juice, which, again, should be legally passed as gravy. Sometimes you wouldn't even receive a cup for your drink. There were no trash cans or toilet paper in the holding cells. There was no privacy either. Once one of us was using the toilets, and another in prison protester stood up to give them privacy as a guard walked in. A guard threatened to tase the prisoner and stood up. This kind of verbal abuse and threats were common. Meanwhile, on the men's side, they had become tired of being abused and faced unfair labor conditions to the point in which they started a strike. Until we told them about the strike, the women's side of Santa Rita had no idea about the men's organized resistance, but I'd been given all the men's duties while their complaints were went ignored. They were completely separate roles. Next, I want to introduce Ray. Um, she will speak on the um, very um, targeted and inhumane treatment that our non-binary Good morning. Uh, my name is Ray. I'm a non-binary artist and activist currently attending art school in Oakland. I use they, them, theirs, or any gender-neutral pronouns. My work focuses on trans existence, living with depression, and healing from PTSD. I will be speaking today on the treatment of LGBTQIA plus arrestees. Given the deep intersections of transphobic and anti-homelessness violence embedded in city and national policies, it left no one surprised that at least half of the 22 housing justice village arrestees late Sunday night were trans people, nor was it surprising that we went on to deal with a number of human rights violations as trans people once in the county's jail. Law enforcement verbally harassed us, jeering at our pronouns and names, saying we looked like the sex we were assigned at birth and therefore should be treated as such and housed with that sex. We were also forced to answer questions from the jail nurse and the officers that processed us for housing about if we had gender identity disorder an outdated, now scientifically disproven classification that was taken out of the American Psychological Association's Manual of Mental Disorders seven years ago. It is unprofessional and blatantly transphobic for Santa Rita Jail to be used, still using this language and assigning it to inmates. Law enforcement in jail, as trans siblings have, have survived for years, particularly violated trans femme and trans women arrestees' human rights. One trans femme arrestee, bystander at the protest caught completely off guard when arrested, was severely targeted by law enforcement. After refusing to be searched by men, they had their clothes cut and ripped off of them while alone in a cell with four male officers. They were later put into male high security housing, putting them at especially high risk for harassment and assault. They were also held alone in an empty cell with no toilet for an entire day. Another trans femme was held in solitary for the entire night and day and given no bed. Forcing trans people into solitary confinement is a psychologically abusive policy. Both of these arrestees are also unhoused people. According to a 2014 survey conducted by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and the Williams Institute at UCLA Law, 60 to 70 percent of trans people in the U.S. have reported being physically and or sexually harassed by law enforcement, and 68 percent have experienced homelessness. 
Another study by the Williams Institute in 2012 found that 40% of homeless youth, youth were LGBTQIA+. Homelessness is an issue that disproportionately affects LGBTQIA plus individuals, particularly trans people. Law enforcement and the prison system's explicit violations of trans people's human rights is unacceptable. We demand an end to the city's deliberate, cruel, and inhumane treatment of Oakland's unhoused trans residents. The city's actions filter low-income, black and brown trans people into jail and out again onto the streets, in a never-ending street-to-prison pipeline that leaves people with nowhere to go. This logic is deeply twisted, and again, Libby's policies are inhumane and unacceptable. Thank you. So we had um, unhoused folks from other cities come and join us uh, in solidarity, uh, Berkeley in particular, um, with the Here There camp, and of course they came for the homeless, um, because you know they, the struggle that we have faced here is a struggle that they're facing in Berkeley, is a struggle that is a struggle we're facing around the world. And we recently, some of us recently had an opportunity to meet an unhoused woman from Malaysia who was doing the same exact work that we're doing here. The State Department gave her a fellowship to come to California and Washington, D.C. so she could study how well the United States deals with the homeless. And she was like, actually, it's the same. <laughs> it's terrible. And so this is an international um, crisis. And what each of the governments, whether it's Oakland or Malaysia, are using upon the unhoused people is the same tactics of inhumanity and cruelty and how to solve this problem. So I want to introduce Juan with the Here There encampment that came for the homeless to uh, share. Excuse me. Today I want to make um, two statements. One is uh, homeless have no address, permanent addresses. The second one is solidarity. So um, I'm printing a house. Um, my ID says that I have. A, um, I, I currently use a hack address from, from Berkeley, but that's not my permanent address. Um, the reason why house folks don't have any address is because we constantly get shuffled around from being told to move along from sleeping in doorways of shops to being constantly evicted and harassed um, by the city government. Um, and um, on house folks, they move from one city to the next. Um, and it's about solidarity. So <clears throat> I currently reside at the Here Deck Camp in Berkeley. Um, came to Oakland to support the initiation of the protest from the Village and East Oakland Collective because we're fighting the same struggle. Mm. We have groups from Berkeley that also supported the protest on the 24th, which is Berkeley Friends on Wheels and the Where Did We Go campaign in Berkeley. Um, when I was in jail, it was really stressful, but I had in mind that Number of, number of us in the same institution as me. And also there are comrades outside uh, coordinating for our bail. So that gave me a sense of camaraderie and solidarity. Do you have any more questions about this? You can ask me after this. Okay. And we'll wrap up the statements with Stephen DiCaprio of the Matthew Johnson Civil Liberties Institute. Um, the Matthew Johnson Civil Liberties Institute, um, part of the work, uh, I'm off the program director of that organization, but part of the work we do is um, reporting directly to the United Nations Human Rights Councils and its 25 different committees, especially because the Trump administration has refused to do so, and he's the first president in the US to actually do that. So the work that we've been doing has been to collect <coughs> the testimonies um, and the experiences of people most impacted by the human rights abuses here in, in the United States, whether it be about racism or uh, the discrimination of women or, the, or torture, abuse in prisons, or the discrimination against black folks, et cetera, et cetera. And so the most recent report that just got turned in by Stephen is around the criminalization of homelessness here. 
uh, which is very timely with what's happening across. And a copy of that is where Italia is sitting. So if people want to see a copy of it before, you can get a hard copy of it. Thank okay. you. Stephen? Yes, uh, Nina B is the program director for the Michael Johnson Liberties Institution. It's a lot of titles. Uh, <laughs> it's one of them. My title is executive director or interim executive director. We are hiring, by the way, to replace me on step down to uh, January 31st of 2020. I'm going to join the board, so we're going to continue working on these issues. Nita B is going to continue as a program director. So if anyone wants to apply for that position, go to our website, website mclihumanrights.org. The job announcement's there. Um, you know, if I was to go into someone's home and, you know, kick them out of their house and, and just tear the house down and that person died of exposure, I would be charged with murder. Um, and something, you know, when I studied law, you know, they won't give me a law license, but I studied law and I, can't, I cannot wrap my mind around how is this not murder? Is Libby Schaff not murdering people? When you go into an encampment and people are sheltering themselves from the elements, which is necessary for survival, I mean, we all need to sleep, and we all need to be sheltered from risk of exposure. When she and her minions go into these camps and steal people's tents and then kick them out into the elements, how is that not murder? How is that not mass murder? So the right to life is the most fundamental right we have. A human being has a right to be alive. I feel like the fact that I even have to say this is, is, is insane. Like what kind, of, what kind of world are we living in where I have to actually get out and say we have a right to be alive? Like that is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's like life is first, liberty is second, and then happiness, pursuing it at least, is third. Um, this is universal. I, there's no, I don't think of any kind of legal framework in which being alive is not a fundamental right. So that's something that we address in the report to the UN Human Rights Council. And Nita B and I are going to work to get, uh, with support from this community and communities that, that are compassionate about this issue, um, a delegation of people who are unhoused, who, have ex who are currently experiencing these issues, to talk to the UN Human Rights Council and to tell their stories to the Human Rights Council in Geneva. So that's going to take a lot of doing, but we're going to have to we're going to have to make this happen. Um, the other right is to not be tortured. Um, under Martin v. Boise, criminalizing homelessness is prohibited by the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which is the prohibition against torture. Sleep deprivation is well established as a form of torture, and the way homeless people are treated in Oakland is torture. Um, so that's, we discussed that in this um, report. Um, there's some legal frameworks on the human rights aspect outside of the U.S. Constitution. Um, <clears throat> Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which has been re reframed as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic and Social Cultural Rights. Um, these are the treaty frameworks for human rights. And um, the, the, basically, there's a lot of treaties and, and it, it gets more expansive, but um, the right to life is fundamental under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also the, both treaties, civil and political rights, and also economic and social and cultural rights. Um, the right to be free from torture, of course, is, is guaranteed under U UN Human Rights Law you know, that the U.S. has signed. Um, and also the right to housing is under the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, I mean, first and foremost, people have a right to be alive. Secondly, they have a right to not be tortured. But thirdly, people have a right to housing. People have a right to a home. So we're so far removed from compliance with the norms of, of human rights law that we're talking about whether or not it's okay to kill people when we should be talking about 
how are we going to provide housing for everyone? Low income, no income housing. That should be the conversation. And so when Libby Shab and her people come to an encampment and think anything other than how can I help you, they're violating <coughs> our rights, they're violating the Constitution, and they're violating universal human rights law. Um, that is the only, and, 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 as, and they're just violating basic principles of being human. So when you see people in need, either if you're not gonna if, if you're not gonna help, just leave. Don't don't mess with it. Just leave people alone. But they come in and say, "How are we going to get rid of these people?" And that is a criminally um, murdery kind of mindset. So. Um, if you want to take a look at this, uh, we talk about it at great depth, um, and, or I don't think great depth, but we get, have a legal analysis at least, and we have some, some stories in here. So, um, and hopefully we'll have more stories in Geneva, and we'll really bring this home and show Libby Schaff and, and the, every local, state, and federal governments in the U.S. for what they are, which are human rights violating inhumane people who need to change their policies. I think Stephen made up a new word, murdery. <laughs> nice. So we want to open the floor up for any kind of questions. Um, we'll take, take it in the back. Yes, you might leave in the back. You know, I'm pretty familiar with Saturday's process, and I'm wondering, um, out of 22 people, it kind of astounds me that nobody will go on religious and own their pockets. Yeah. Yeah. 22 oh, people. Lord. And I'm wondering, were, uh, when you guys were going through classification, uh, were any of you considered for OR at any point at all? Even when people had their mattresses on the floor, because overpopulation, no. Right. No. And I'm just wondering if anybody was considered for overpopulation. Because I'm looking at this population, and from what I know of the people arrested, I was actually shocked that, number one, they took the all of Santa Rita, because normally uh, on this type of charge, it's a site release. You know? Uh, second thing that shocked me was the amount of bail. I mean, I almost fell over. I said, it's so much a $5,000 bail. I've never, I mean, I've done some pretty darn stuff, but I've never, never gotten a $5,000 bail. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, so that was what I was wondering because um, one of the arguments that can be made in court was unreasonable bail, which is a violation of the 8th Amendment. You know? Um, I mean, I'm looking at people here that are housed, especially if you have a stable address and you have ties to the community with a security threat and there's no violence involved in this charge. Why is it that you weren't extended the law? Because of the fact that Santa Rita is, I think, about 20 or 20 to 30 percent over crowd. There are people sleeping in the hallways with no mattress. Mm -hmm. That's where you want to strike at. I'm going to be. I would say um, I agree with um, Mike's assessment of, um, you know, we really feel like we were targeted because, I mean, I've been part of protests and demonstrations and taking over of buildings mm -hmm. and shutting down bridges and et cetera, et cetera. And anyone who has been detained is cited and released. So what has happened to us is something, the only time I've seen that happen here is when um, Black Lives Matter shut down the uh, West Oakland Park Station. They were hit with felonies, but they didn't even, I don't think they even spent the night in jail. Um, they, were, they were charged, but they got out. They didn't have to spend the night in jail. And there was one other instance that came to mind that's what I'm forgetting. But the I-80, the Black Lives Matter took over the I-80, and all those people were, were, were actually pulled off and charged with, by the CHP. And that was a state felony that they were charged with. And those people on site were processed on site and cited their release. But, they, but they, in this type of a situation, in a clear, <coughs> clearly a nonviolent protest, to see a $5,000 ban, 
I mean, not even a WTO <clears throat> Most of them were captured. We wound up with five thousand dollar bail. I mean, we we have some people that captured actual in the act of breaking Nike's windows, <laughs> and they were sad to be released on the spot. So I've never heard. Of I mean, I'm 64 years old, so I'm a child of 60. I've never seen you know, the, the kind of mischievous and mean spirit And to me, it's a, it's a progressive policy that living has because it started out by simply asking people to move and push them off the sidewalk. Then they went to actually tearing out people's self made homes. Third level now that they've taken it to is they're physically attacking and abusing people. And it's really disturbing that trans people going into Santa Rita and in itself is a harrowing experience. But I can just imagine what what would what happen because you're automatically a security threat according to their process. And yes, you will go into a red suit, and yes, you will get the solitary confinement. It's trans and well, well, trans also put you in the middle of the show without trans. They'll put you they'll mm -hmm. put you in one of the this is their new model of criminalizing homelessness. Like, it's punishment. Stay in the gray area, but this is the way they criminalize homelessness. Right. They're not supposed to. It's supposed to be illegal as per Boise. But this is what criminalizing homelessness looks like. And this is why we're here at this panel to show the world what it looks like. And that it's actually, um, yeah, it's, it's starting to get redundant now. So now we have to take action. So that's why we're here in the first place. To show our model of what criminalizing homelessness looks like in all aspects. There's a step in the escalation of part of the city of the tactics that they're using. And, I, and, and uh, I was thinking this morning, what if that was me after this wheelchair? Would they separate me from this wheelchair and beat yeah, my ass? Oh, oh yeah. Just yeah, yeah. 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 4,000 oh, yeah. in the chair in the back of the truck. Yeah, they'd trash it too. Yeah. Yeah. Bet. Would they actually, you know, do what they're supposed to do and transport me in my wheelchair? Santa Rita? No. The chances are is that, you know, if I hadn't been sick, I wouldn't be sitting in this wheelchair. I'd be sitting in the house, you know, hoping I can get a replacement from easy dust so I can actually get mobile. But it is, it is entirely obvious to me that they are escalating tactics. If they're getting frustrated and they're getting and, and, and they're running out of money. And these are things that we have to keep in mind. But I've never seen, I've never seen this level of she can get ready. Right. <laughs> right. well, we'll right. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let's uh, take another question in the back. Hi. I was just going to say, um, you know, at, at, at the level of, of the city's mentality, that if we're wondering why they have such a punitive and such a separate response to occupation, just, I mean, say, like, that will in the room to them is, is occupied, right? And um, that brought down the mayor effectively uh, from the point of view of the entrenched establishment here. So they're from, in their mind, my own sense is they actually have to have a PTSD around it. The, you see the San Francisco and the Oakland, like when they, they make a discretionary choice to send people far away, they can do that in other places where I've also been. When they don't want you to come out quickly, right? Because it's far away, you know, and all of those things. <clears throat> the anyway, I, I I just feel like the way that they justify that to themselves is through pursuing things like the emergency shelter ordinance, having tough shed villages and things like that, which don't remotely or, or complex or whatever those things. You know, that that accommodation obviously doesn't really make it dent, you know, in terms of the scope of need. Right? But for them, that gives them, in terms of their moral politics, that gives them a license to kind of be, be excessive, right? And come down on, you know, encounters and unsanctioned <coughs> or whatever, in spite of all of the things um, that Steve said and, and all of the things that Alex has said. So I just, I just want to put that out there. It's just like recognizing where their own sort of like, well, not sort of, but kind of production in their own point of view is coming from what's motivating them. I think 
puts all skills right into them. Um, there's also this level of pettiness um, because there is an ongoing tension, for lack of a better word, between whatever is associated with the village and this administration. They literally have never forgiven us for creating the first village and for shaming them for doing nothing for this housing crisis or housing affordability crisis <laughs> and they don't like the fact that we won't go away <clears throat> and that we keep on getting louder and bigger. And I think part of shutting us down, I agree, um, you know, it was very reminiscent of Occupy. Many of us here were actually, many of us here were like leaders in Occupy, actually. And um, I think a bigger thing is that we could not succeed because one, we would have told the public the truth. Um, something to say that once the, the rain goes away, we're planning to be back out there. We may not, we may or may not have tents, we shall see, but what we will have is our info booth, and what we will have is flying ring, and what we will have are the, the, the open mics that we have scheduled and the movies we have scheduled every night on Lambs People's Throats. So once this rain stops, we're going to be back out there. We're not stopping, we're still going to stick with our goal. The public needs to know the truth. And what we saw when we were out there is the public really wanted to engage with us. People like stop. This is on a Sunday. On a quiet Sunday, we had the clouds of you know, puppet. People wanted to talk about how what was happening with homelessness. People are mad. They know that what's happening is not right, but they feel like they have no agency. And so we're not gonna stop. It's our duty. It's our duty to continue to push forward because we know the truth. Um, and I think part of it too to shut us down was to send a message to all the other unhoused folks. Don't you dare speak up. Don't you dare think you've got rights. And she, you know, this administration got another thing coming because they think that unhoused folks are helping them to be quiet. Especially when our tax dollars. We pay money. It's all right. We're going to we cut it off here, folks. We pay our taxes and we do everything any other citizen does. But when you use our tax dollars against us to abuse us, that's when the problem is. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. I see three hands below Kim. Uh,